together. It's not a sequence, but um, it's about Hal's story. So it's like Hal's point of view. All right. So here we go. Chapter 21. Late in the afternoon, the air became chilly again, and we put our jackets on. I could tell that Hal and Kit were getting tired of walking, so I slowed and did a better job of clearing a trail for them. They seemed to find new energy when we came to a creek that poured over a small waterfall into a pond. They followed me to the bottom of the waterfall and walked around the edge of the pond. You two can rest now if you want. Sanders won't come back today. Hal looked at me like he was about to say something, but he didn't. Kit and Hal spread their blankets on the grass and then lay down to rest. After taking a long drink, Snapper plopped down beside Hal and shut his eyes. I looked at the sun and judged there to be a little more than two hours before it would get too dark to see. The forest grew quiet as usual, as it usually does this late in the day, and a few clouds moved over us to cast shadows on the trees. The sides of the ravine sloped up to small embankments that edged a hardwood bottom. I took the knife and went in search of a hickory tree. I didn't have to travel far before I found hickory nuts on the ground and looked up into the trees until I saw hickory leaves. Wrapping my legs and arms around the tree, I ratcheted myself up until I could grab the lowest limb. I swung myself into the tree and balanced with one arm against the trunk. I cut a straight branch that was about as big around as my wrist and dropped it to the ground. Back at the pond, I shaved the smaller growth from the hickory branch until I had a pole that was about six feet long. As I was whittling a barbed point on the end, Kit woke and watched me. Go find a piece of dry, dead wood, Kit. Kit nodded and stood up, and he began walking and then turned back. How will I know the right kind? Find a piece on the ground that's about as big around as your leg and two feet long. If you can break it against the tree, it's dead. Be quick, it's going to get dark soon. Kit nodded and hurried away. I set the hickory pole down and grabbed one of the small branches that I had shaved from it. Using a shoelace, I made a tiny bow. By the time I finished, Kit had returned with the dead wood. What are you making? A fish spear. Kit sat across from me and watched as I took another of the small branches and shaved a straight stick as long as my arm and as big around as my thumb. Wrapping the bowstring around my small stick, I made a drill to use against the dead wood that Kit found. After I drilled a small hole into the wood, I told Kit to go pull some bark from a dead cedar tree that I'd seen up the hill. He stood once more and took a few steps in the direction that I pointed. He turned and looked back at me. It's a furry looking tree, I told him. How can you not even know what a cedar tree looks like, Hal said, disgusted. Kit and I watched him stand from where, he, where he'd been sleeping. Come on, he said, sighing. I'll show it to you. I used the cedar bark that they brought me to kindle the fire from the heat made at the tip of the bow drill. Kit and Hal watched quietly while I hardened the point of, pointed tip of the spear in the flame. Well, what about the smoke? Kit asked. Won't somebody see it? Look up there, I said, pointing at a place several feet over the fire where the smoke dissolved. You don't get much smoke with dry wood. Kit looked at Hal. I bet you didn't know that. Hal squinted his eyes at Kit. You better watch your mouth, he said. We both knew he didn't mean it and smiled. We rolled our pant legs up and thrashed through the shallow pond until all of the fish were corralled at one end. I speared about six bass together that were enough to feed the three of us and have some left over for later. As I tried for the last fish, Hal tripped over something in the muddied water and fell. He went completely under and exploded back up yelling. He thought he'd been tripped, and I saw Kit's eyes grow wide when Hal charged towards him. No, Hal, Kit yelled. I hurried out of the way as both of them crashed beneath the surface. Snapper got excited, sprung to his feet, and then launched himself into the water with them. Before long, the two of them stood, fell, and tripped and laughed their way to the bank, with Snapper leaping up at their faces. As the forest grew dark, the four of us watched the fish cooking on the spit that I'd rigged from more of the green hickory branches. A breeze slipped through the trees at the top of the ravine. Kit and Hal sat wrapped up in their blankets and stared at the food, their uniforms and jackets draped over a rack that I'd made near the fire to dry them out. Snapper lay beneath them with his chin on the ground and jowls flayed out. He moved only his eyeballs to watch my hands tend the fish. How did fish get that big in that pond? Kit asked. They swam, stupid, grumbled Hal. They come in when it floods, I said. Oh, shut up, Hal. 
Hal raised his hand from beneath the blanket and held it above Kit's head like he was going to hit him. But he didn't, and he put his hand back down. Kit looked at me, and his eyes burned with mischief. You like this, Kit? He nodded. Well, what about you, Hal? Hal just shrugged. Better, better than going to hell in Weiler. When the fish were done, I stabbed three fillets with sticks and gave each, gave one to each of them. The other fillets I wrapped in one of my socks for later. Kit and Hal ate quickly, and I could tell they were hungry that, and that the fish tasted good to them. Tomorrow we can boil water and make pine needle or sassafras tea. Is that good? Kit wanted to know. I nodded. It's real good. We can get some mint weed and make it taste even better. We lay on our sides and watched the fire dying. A bobcat screamed in the distance. Snapper's ears twitched and a low moan came from his throat. What in the hell? Hal said. Bobcat, I replied. Pap says it sounds like a screaming woman. Hal and Kit looked behind themselves into the shadows. I sure hope you can whip that thing, Hal said. Oh, won't mess with you, I said. Nothing out here will mess with you if you don't mess with it. How long until we go to Alaska? Kit asked. I shrugged my shoulders. I guess we'll go when we y'all learn about living in the forest. Alaska's a long way, Hal said. Yeah, Kit replied. But there's more people like Moon up there. It's a place where they won't chase him. Isn't that right, Moon? That's what Pap says. What do you think they're going to do to us if they catch us, Moon? Hal asked. Oh, they're not going to catch us. That Sanders fellow seems pretty mad at you. I ain't never seen anybody act like that over a couple of people running away. He might be mad about me whipping up on him. Well, he's pr plenty of pissed for some reason. Anybody that doesn't know you can't set a bloodhound loose and run after his nose can't be too smart. Well, what's that? Bloodhounds aren't meant by nature. Oh, aren't mean by nature like some other dogs. You got to keep them on a leash and let them take you to whatever they're tracking or else they're going to run off. Well, how do you know about bloodhounds? I know about all kinds of animals. I got animal books back at the shelter. I've got tree books and plant books and trap books. Pap's got about a hundred wrapped in a garbage bag under the spice shelf. My daddy never did learn to read good, Hal said. He was so drunk most of the time he could barely see. Is that why they sent you to Pinson? Kit asked. Hal shook his head. Nah, I lived with my mama. She ran off and took me with her when I was 11. We lived in a place called Elrod for a while. I got in a lot of trouble, stealing and stuff. So they took me away from her. Said she couldn't control me. But I never did like living with her anyway. I didn't want anything else but to be back with my daddy. Well, I thought you said he was drunk all the time, Kit said. It didn't matter none to me. He was still the best daddy you could have. We lived outside a little town called Union. And we'd hunt and fish and work on the truck together. Just hang around the clay pit. It wasn't his clay pit, but he looked after it for the owner and took the money from people coming in to get truckloads of dirt. We had a trailer parked up on the edge of it, and when it rained for a couple of days, that pit got a little water in the bottom. Come dark, Daddy'd make me take me outside to where he had some chairs set up. He'd tell me how lucky we were to have waterfront property. It looked like a lake in the moonlight. And after a while, he'd finish whatever he was drinking and throw it out there into the lake. It'd stab into the mud, and it seemed like it was floating. Y'all sit out there and watch those bottles? We'd watch for a while. It wouldn't be long before Daddy would get to shooting. He likes to shoot bottles. Sometimes we'd line up a bunch of them at the edge of the pit and blow them to pieces. I like that, I said, shooting bottles. He stared into the fire. He said I was his best friend, and he cried when I left with Mama. I didn't see him. I didn't like seeing him cry. My pap was my best friend, too, I said. I cried when I knew he was dying. We were all quiet for a few minutes. An owl called from down the ravine. I just remember the hospitals I was in, Kit said into the fire. I got to be friends with a couple of the nurses and the doctors, but I'd always have to move on to another hospital or a boy's home. Kit looked up at me. I've been in a lot of places besides Pinson. I used to live at a, a Crichton Children's Hospital in Delaware until they found out I had an aunt in Alabama. They sent me down here to live with her, but by the time the paperwork was done I was and I was on the bus, she was dead. She died while you were on the bus, Hal said. She, Kit nodded. That's right. I got to Birmingham and stayed at the hospital there while they decided what to do with me. I got sick again and ended up staying for a year. They stuck me in the back with needles and gave me medicine that made my hair fall out. They said I almost died. 
And when the doctors decided I was better, they sent me to George Jenkins Boys Home in Montgomery. It was the worst place I have ever stayed, but anything was better than the shots at the hospital. George Jenkins didn't have air conditioning, and it was all stuffed full with boys in a bunk room without windows. You could hear people breathing all night like they had honey in their throats, and they were about to choke. And when you'd wake up in the mornings, sweat soaked your bed. After six months, I got sick again, and they sent me back to Birmingham. I stayed in the hospital another year before I was better, and then they sent me to Pinson. He's what they call property of the state, Hal said. Well, so are you, said Kit. Yeah, but you're the real thing. Kit's face grew tight with frustration. No more real than you, Hal. You're not anybody's property now, I in interrupted. Neither of you. That's right, Hal. I'm not anybody's property. Hal leaned back on his elbows and spit to the side. Whatever, he said. Kit looked at me. We're still going to Alaska, right? You haven't changed your mind, have you? Of course we're going to Alaska, I said. Soon as we get you two trained and get supplies, I figure we'll... We've made close to five miles today. We have but we have gone further if there aren't so many hills. Tomorrow we'll walk some more to get far away from Sanders. We can start making camp tomorrow late afternoon. I wonder how big this forest is, Kit asked. We haven't seen a road or heard a car since the fire tower. It's a national forest, Hal said. They're about as much woods as you can find. Are we going to build a shelter like the one you lived in, Kit asked. No, we'll do that when we get to Alaska. I've got another kind of kind in mind for here. Kit smiled to himself, and he rolled into his blanket and stared at the sky like he was thinking of Alaska. Hal and I watched the fire for a while without speaking. I thought about what Kit had said about all of those places he'd lived and all of Hal not and of Hal not getting to see his pap. Hal, I said, yeah. You have any paper in your pockets? What for? Pap said I could write him letters and burn him and that he'd read the smoke. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard of. No, I don't have any. You never heard of that? No. Have you ever heard of that, Kit? Kit shook his head. No, but that doesn't mean it won't work. You two are screwed up, Hal said. I'm going to sleep. I got up and put my blanket over my clothes so that they wouldn't collect more moisture from the air that night. What are you going to sleep with? Kit asked. Oh, I'll be okay with just my clothes. Hal grunted disapprovingly. I stretched out by the fire again and put my hands behind my head. Hal, I said, what? Maybe you could teach me some good cuss words sometime and I'll say them to Sanders. I ain't saying nothing to Sanders. Oh, you ain't saying nothing to Sanders while I'm around. Well, I'm going to whip up on him good then. No, you won't. Go to sleep. Chapter 22. I woke before sunup and climbed out of the ravine through the thick fog. At the top of the hill, the land looked like islands of treetops between the clouds. I sat on a smooth stone and watched the sunlight slide up the trees and listened to the forest come alive. I thought about Hal and Kit still asleep. I was glad they were with me. And then I thought about Pap again. Using a piece of pine bark and a rock shard, I began to scratch a note to him. And I soon discovered that it would take me all day to tell him everything that I wanted to say. So I settled for the on only a few words. Pap, I love you. From somewhere below, I heard a dog barking, and it wasn't Snapper. It was too far away. It was another dog coming down the ravine. I shoved the pine bark into my pocket and began to run back down the hill to the pond. And when I dropped into the fog again, the sound of the dog was faint and dulled. Snapper rose as I stumbled into camp. He took Hal's blanket on. He, he took Hal's blanket on his back with him, and Hal sat up suddenly. Hey, he said as the dog to the dog, and then crossed his arms over his chest. It's cold, Shh, I said. Get up, Kit. Hal and Kit took their clothes from under the blanket on the drying rack and began to put them on. They're still wet, Hal said. They'll dry out the rest of the way when you get to when we get to walking. I said. Now listen. What is it? Kit asked. Sanders is back with another dog. I said quietly. Hal snatched his blanket from Snapper's back. Give me that, he said. There's a dog coming, Hal. Kit said. Hal scratched his head. He threw the blankets to the ground, frustrated. I heard he'll just have to eat me because I can't run. I haven't had any decent sleep in two days. I'm half frozen. And I got a crick in my neck. I smell like a bloodhound that's got ticks and mud and spit all over him. And I just can't run. I can't even climb a tree. Well, get quiet, I said. And I heard the dogs bark through the fog again. I went and stood beside Snapper 
and watched him while I listened. And he whined and looked at me. It's coming too fast for it to be on a leash. I think Sanders got up early and turned loose another hound on us. Well, maybe it's one of those that's naturally mean, Kit said. I shook my head. It's a bloodhound. It sounds just like Snapper. We set out that morning with another dog added to our company. Sawbone, Davy Sanders, 34 Big Pine Road, Gainesville, Alabama. What are we going to do with all these damn dogs? Hal asked me. I shrugged my shoulders. We don't have to do anything with them. They'll do what they're going to do on their own. Well, how are we going to feed them if they keep following us? Well, dogs are better at getting food than people are. They'll be all right. We climbed from the ravine and started up out of the bottom. Along the way, I showed Hal and Kit the difference between a red oak tree and a white oak, oak tree. And we collected acorns until our pockets were bulging. When we came to the top of a hill, we sat down to rest. The fog had ev evaporated out of the valleys, and we saw the countryside rolling away to the south. Patches of green showed the pines, and darker gray patches showed the hardwoods. The sky was clear, and the forest flicked with life. A broad wing hawk sailed between the hills at eye level. I lay back in the leaves, and, uh, and the others did the same. I'd like to see this when the dogwoods bloom, I said. You got anything to drink, Hal asked me. There's going to be water at the bottom of this hill. There's water at the bottom of every hill. Well, what about the dogwoods? Kit asked. They're the prettiest trees out here. It's like white cotton in the air. It plays tricks on your eyes. Can you eat it? Hal wanted to know. No, but you can eat sparkle berries and you can eat honeysuckle. They'll be out at the same time in most of the same places as dogwoods. A little later, we'll get blackberries and mulberries and all kinds of stuff. Suddenly, Hal hollered and rolled over. I sat up quickly and looked at him. He was rubbing his arm and eyeing a thistle plant growing beside him. That thing's good eating, Hal, I said. I got up and walked over to the plant. I used the knife to cut a stem and strip its outer layer. See here, I said, holding it up. There's more over there, Kit said, and he pointed to an open field to our left. We spent close to half an hour picking and peeling thistle stems before setting off down the other side of the hill. That afternoon, we stopped at a creek that flowed from a marsh with bay trees and cattails. After a lunch of acorns and thistle stems and our leftover fish, I took off my clothes and waded naked into the cattails to gather our supper. Blue herons rose from their nests high in the leafless tops of the cypress trees and squawked at me. Hal and Kit were lying on their blankets when I returned. The sun and lunch had made them drowsy. And when I told them to look at my armful of cattail roots, only Kit opened his eyes slightly and smiled. I let them rest for a few minutes more before we set out through the hills again. We tromped up from the bottom and across the fields of dry clay and rock shards. Once we were in the trees, we walked east along the top of the ridge. It was unusually warm, and all of us wore our jackets around our waists. Where do you reckon that Sanders fellow is? Hal asked. I don't know. Are you scared of him? Well, I don't want to... I don't take to anybody that wants to shoot me. He won't find us, Hal. Pap and I hid out for years and nobody found us. Hal shook his head and didn't say anything. We can stop and set some traps if you want. Nah, Hal said. Just keep going to where it is, wherever it is you're taking us. God knows I don't know where the hell we are. Chapter 23. Towards late afternoon, we'd traveled a few miles across hills and down several valleys and through their creeks. I came to the top of a ridge and knelt to examine a track. I've only seen one such track before, but there was no mistaking it. Kit and Hal caught up to me and stood over my shoulder. What is it? Kit asked. It's a puma track, I said. Pap told me that puma needs 30 square miles of territory with no signs of people. So that means we're far away from civilization? Kit asked. That's right, I said. Great, Hal said, in the middle of nowhere with a mountain lion. It won't hurt us. Pap said I was too big. That boy in Old Yeller was about your size, Hal said. That's just a made-up story. Pap knew about animals. All right, you fight it then, Hal said, with that knife of yours. Kit and I smiled at each other and started down the other side of the ridge. Just before the sun fell below the forest canopy, we stopped and sat on a log to rest. I looked around and studied the trees. This is a good place, I said. We'll camp here. Finally, Hal said. What's for supper? Snake and dressing. Hal looked at me. Snake? 
Yeah, snakes are good, I said. There may be some out since it was so warm today. I'll make some pine needle tea to go with it. Hal spit at the ground. I ain't eating no damn snake. It was bad enough eating fish out of your old sock. I'll, I'll eat some, Kit said. Um, come on, I said to Kit, you can help me. Hal, there's a white oak tree over there. You collect some acorns from under it while we're gone. More acorns? What about real meat? Hal asked. We're going to get you some soon, I said. We'll have all the good food we need once I rig some weapons. Hal rolled his eyes inside. He got up and dragged his feet to the, in the direction of the oak tree with the dogs following. Kit and I set out through an open stand of old pine trees. And after a while, I found what I was looking for. I showed Kit a long-leaf pine filled with holes, starting about 50 feet from the ground. From each of the holes, sap ran down the tree, making it look like a giant candlestick. These holes were made by a red, cockaded woodpecker, I said, pointing up at the top of the tree. Kit nodded and stared. We walked around the tree. Sometimes there'll be a snake climbing up to get some of those woodpeckers. He'll get into the... the he'll get into those sap runs, and they'll make him dizzy. He'll fall to the ground. If you, ca if you catch him after he falls, he'll usually be stunned, and you can just pick him up by the tail and knock him against a tree. I don't see any snakes, Kit said. Poke around in the grass. We might find one. It'll be a corn snake or a rat snake, probably. After some kicking around, I found a black rat snake. I grabbed it by the tail and knocked it against a tree. Kit wanted to carry it, so I gave it to him, and he dragged it back with us. Hal was sleeping against a log when we returned. He opened his eyes and winced at the snake. Kit swung it towards him, and Hal rolled over and shouted, Hey! Kit and I began to laugh. It's just a black rat snake, Kit said confidently. Hal held up his fist and shook it at us with wide eyes. I'll trade a black eye for a black snake. You keep that thing away from me. I showed Kit how to make a slit down the belly and around the neck and to peel the skin back like a sock. Afterwards, we removed the head and intestine and stuffed the stomach cavity with paste made from the white oak acorns, cat tail roots, and thistle. I found a piece of dead wood nearby and dropped it in front of Kit. You remember how I started that fire? Kit nodded and took the bow drill from me. I need a bath, Hal complained. Sweat clean, cleans as good as swimming, I said. He looked at me and didn't say anything. The sun set and the birds became quiet as the forest grew dark. I left Kit and Hal and the dogs and walked downhill to, the, to look for a creek. I hadn't gone far when I found one of the giant loblolly pines leaning over so I could walk up its trunk and stand high above the ground, which sloped away from beneath me. I could hear water down below and the tops of the trees swishing to the breeze. I imagined that I would be able to see a long way with daylight. And when I returned, Kit was still drilling on the wood and faint curls of smoke drifted up from the bowl. I had brought some juniper bark back with me, and I shredded it and laid it in the bowl. I blew on it gently, and a tiny, tiny flame appeared. I found a creek down there, I said. We'll call it Kit Creek. You gotta have a name for things. Kit smiled, and I could tell he liked having a creek named after him. We cooked the snake and dressing it on a spit and ate it like a sausage. Kit claimed that it was better than anything that he had ever had at Pinson. Hal didn't eat his share. He put his back to us and chewed on some of the leftover cattails. After supper, I suggested we go drink from Kit Creek. Hal said he'd go later, so Kit and I set out alone. I showed him the tree I found, and we walked up into it. This is where we're going to live for a while, I told him. Up here? I nodded. And underneath. We'll make a, a lookout up here and build our sleeping room down below. Gray clouds moved over us. And the forest grew even darker. Thunder rumbled in the distance, and I looked up at the sky and felt a twang of worry. For the first time, it occurred to me that I might not be able to keep Kit and Hal comfortable. I tried not to think about the weather and continued to tell Kit about our new home. We'll start tomorrow, I said. We've got water below and plenty of forest to the east. <coughs> Hardwood down below and pine forest to the top. That'll give us all types of plants to eat. Kit looked around like he was imagining us there. I'll bet you can see a long ways from here with daylight, he said. I nodded. That's what I was thinking, too. We'll be able to tell better tomorrow morning. And you can whip up on anybody who climbs this tree trunk. Yep, you're right, I said. 
Somebody's coming up here. It's going to get a butt whooping. Kit became excited and laughed. Come on, I said. Let's go get some water. We came down the tree and walked to the creek. I don't think Hal likes it out here, Kit said. Kit only said something that I already knew, but he, I hadn't let myself believe it. He's just getting used to things, I told him. I, we bent and scooped our hands full of water and drank. He was talking some more about his daddy while you were gone a while ago. He says he wants to see him again. I took a deep breath. You think he's going to leave? I don't know. I drank the cool water and stared at my hands as I swallowed. I don't want him to go, I said. Me neither. He's not really mean. Yeah, I know. I didn't want to talk about it anymore. I stood up and started back and Kit followed. We passed Hal, tromping down the slope of, to the creek in the dark with the dogs following him. I looked up at the sky again and it was heavy with storm. It's right down there, Hal, I said. It's not far. I'll find it, he grumbled. Just let the dogs show you where to go. Back at the fire, I told Kit my plans to build our shelter, then began to make weapons and traps. I could start by making a bow out of a fish spear that I'd made the night before. It was hard not to wonder about Hal, though, and if he was going to leave. I didn't want to bring it up when he returned for, and when he returned for fear that it might make the idea come to his head if it hadn't already. Instead, I thought of everything I could do to make him comfortable. Take some of these pine needles, Hal, and put them under your blanket. You can stuff your jacket with dry marsh grass, and it'll make a better pillow. He sprinkled the pine needles that I handed him across the ground half-heartedly. Then he looked around like he might see more marsh grass nearby. We can go back down to Kit Creek, Creek and I'll show you where the soft grass is, I said. I didn't have a soft pillow last night. I don't guess I'll be missing one too much tonight either. The thunder rumbled closer and I looked up at the sky. Don't rain now, I said to myself. But I knew by the thickness of the air that the storm was closing in on us. And I looked over at Hal with a sinking feeling. He was spreading his blanket and didn't seem to notice the weather. Kit and I watched the fire after Hal rolled up in his blanket to go to sleep. After a few minutes, Kit leaned over and whispered, what do you think? I don't know. Is it going to rain tonight? It is, isn't it? Yeah. He's not going to like that, Kit said. We just need to get our shelter built. We got to get it built fast and get him comfortable. First thing in the morning and then... We got to get him some foodie likes. And I looked at Kit. He'll stay then, don't you think? Kit looked at me and nodded quickly, but I could tell he wasn't sure. He'll stay then, I repeated to myself. Kit eventually lay on his side and watched the fire until he fell asleep. I stared at his closed eyes and felt myself getting lonely again. I reached into my pocket and pulled out the crumbled piece of pine bark that I'd written to Pap on that morning and dumped it in the hot coals. I lay down and watched the little flame lick the edges of it, creating a thin line of smoke that curled up into the darkness. Chapter 24. The rain came hard that night, and the red clay ran down the hillside into our hair and down our backs. The three of us sat shivering with wet blankets hanging over our shoulders, and I realized I'd made a mistake. Pap had always told me that shelter was the most important thing in the forest. He said it, you could go for days without water and even weeks without food, but being caught in a storm would get you sick and maybe dead. The one thing I knew we had going for us was that it wasn't, it wouldn't get too cold as long as we had cloud cover to keep the heat down near the ground. <coughs> the temperature was still well above freezing. We might not get sick if we made a shelter and dried our clothes and blankets before nightfall the next day. Let's go find a magnolia tree, I yelled at them through the storm. The leaves are big enough to keep the rain off. They looked up and nodded at me with chattering teeth, and we walked stiffly through the darkness, trying to place our feet where they didn't slide from un out from under us with the mud. The dogs followed like they didn't care and didn't feel the rain at all. I located a magnolia and pointed for them to get under it, under its broad leaves. The three of us crawled beneath and sat with our backs against the trunk. Holly trees can keep you out of the rain too, I said. They didn't respond. The dogs settled a few yards from us and watched with their chins on their paws. The rain didn't come as hard under the tree, but it still dripped on us pretty steadily. Hal was the first to put the wet blanket over his head for protection. Soon, Kit followed, and I was left staring at the two lumps beside me. We're going to have shelter tomorrow, I said loudly. 
and weapons. We'll be able to kill a deer and get meat. Neither of them replied or moved from under their blankets. And no school, I reminded them. And we'll shut up, Moon, Hal yelled. I grew sick with worry as Hal's, Hal's words echoed in my mind. I wanted to ask Kit if he was mad at me too, but I was afraid of what he might say. I lowered my chin to my chest and let my own teeth start to chatter. The rain poured around us and dripped from the leaves down onto my head and then off my bangs and into my lap. After a while, I pulled the blanket over my head and crossed my arms and shivered. The storm slowed to a cold drizzle in the dark early morning hours. No one else stirred when I got up and left for the leaning pine tree. Even the dogs nestled deeper into the leaves and seemed to want no part of moving about. I found my way to the place where we'd made the fire and then walked downhill until I saw the black shadow of a leaning pine and heard the rolling of a swollen creek below. I worked until after daylight, placing long poles of shaved bay branches against the trunk and crossing them with fans of green pine needles to shed the rain. On the inside of the shelter, I cleared the ground of rocks and sticks so that it would make a smooth surface for marsh grass that I would put down later. When the lower shelter was complete, I dragged the soft boughs of bay trees up into the limbs and crisscrossed them to make a platform. On top of those, I laid a bed of pine, dead pine needles that were dried of sap. An hour after daylight, I had mostly completed a rough shelter that would keep the three of us dry. Above was the lookout platform where we could also sleep when the weather was warm. The drizzling rain had stopped and the forest was overcast and dripping. When I returned to the magnolia tree, Kit was there with his blanket wrapped around his shoulders and he smiled weakly. Where are Hal and the dogs, I asked. Kit hesitated for a moment. Gone, he said. Gone? Kit looked worried. A while ago, he got up and left, and the dogs followed him. Back to the fire? Looking for me? Where? He said he was going home. Home? I asked. Kit nodded. Already? Which way? Kit pointed up the hill, and I spun around and ran. I broke from the trees search and searched right and then left, and then saw Hal and the dogs sitting in the distance. Hal! I yelled. The dogs looked back at me, but Hal stared away. I ran after him, jumping fallen timber and ducking low branches. Once I tripped and fell on my face, but when I got up, Hal was watching me. He made me walk the rest of the way until I was stooped before him with my hands on my knees, trying to catch my breath. I thought, I thought you were leaving, I said to the ground. I am, as soon as I figure out which way to go. Don't leave, Hal. I just can't do this anymore. I'm cold and wet and hungry. I got ticks in my hair. I stood up. I can get ticks out. All you have to do, I know you can do all that. I've never seen anybody that knew more about living out in the woods. The shelter is almost built. I'm going to make my, I'm going to make a bow today. And I got up early so I could get everything done. I pleaded. I just want to go home. He said, Hal, you know, all that I said about not caring who, who came dogs are people. Well, I like that you all, that you came. Hal looked down like he didn't know what to say. I cared that who came, I said. Be honest with you. I could probably take all of this for a while longer, but I want to see my daddy. I got a few more years before I'm 18 and the state releases me. If I've got to spend, if I've got to spend him hiding out, I want to hide out with him as long as possible. I didn't want him to go and I felt like crying, but I knew he was right. You go ahead then, I said. I wish you were going to stay with us, but I know about Paps, and I want to be with mine too. I thought you just didn't like me. Hal shook his head. I just want to see my daddy. Well, you best turn around and go back down the hill where you where you can follow the creek. If you trace any water long enough, you'll get to roads and people. You taking those dogs with you? I don't seem to have much choice. I didn't ask them to come. I've never seen dogs take to anybody like that, Hal spit. Well, I ain't one to be mean to him, he said. I'd better get on if I'm going to find a road and hitch a ride to daddy's place. I nodded. Good luck with Alaska, he said. All right. Good luck hiding out with your pap. Hal smiled weakly and turned to go. I was still sitting there watching them walk away when Hal turned and looked at me and said, thanks again for getting me out of Pinson, Moon. All right, you guys, I'm stopping there. Like three minutes after. She hasn't even stopped the video yet. Pretty much.